I'm Dr. Tara, and this is Hopeful Hints, a podcast where you'll receive quick, hopeful hints on all things women's health and infertility. Here, you will find education, inspiration, and most importantly, find peace and empowerment as you walk through the next steps in your healthcare journey. Welcome to Hopeful Hints. I'm your host, Dr. Tara, and excited because if you recognize, we have Dr. Adam Duke. A year ago, we did like our first ever podcast. I wasn't even like planning to put video out there. I just really wanted to get information out there. And you so kindly agreed to do it. And now it's Endo Awareness Month again. Here we are for round two. So this is the first of our series that we're going to do this month. So make sure to follow along. But thank you, Dr. Adam Duke, for being with us and just keeping the conversation open and being on there on social and just talking about this disease, this devastating disease that we need to just be talking about more in this and the proper diagnoses for it. But today, and of course, we'll always sprinkle in endometriosis, but today's topic is going to be adenomyosis because, well, we don't talk about that enough either. And it sometimes goes hands in hand with, with endo. So maybe just begin by sharing what it is. Like, let's just start with what is adenomyosis versus endometriosis. Sure. So the simplest definition of adenomyosis is the presence of endometrial glandular tissue within the muscle layer of the uterus. If you think about the uterus, the uterus, the majority of it is muscle and it's what it's smooth muscle. And that muscle is what contracts when you're having contractions, when you're, when you're pushing a baby out, um, and lining that, that myometrium is, is the endometrium. And that's what you slough off every month when you have a period and you don't get pregnant and it, it, it sloughs off and then regenerates. Um, and when that glandular tissue from the endometrium sort of works its way out into the muscle layer of the uterus, that is adenomyosis. And how often is it that it endo, endo, adeno, adeno only, like, what does that look like in your practice? Yeah. We, we see adenomyosis a lot because it is a source of, of pelvic pain and sort of the hallmark of adenomyosis is the, the severely painful periods typically accompanied by heavy menstrual flow, clotting, uh, patients will describe passing black or dark clots during their cycle. But, but the way that, that adenomyosis sort of differs from endometriosis is that endometriosis is, is tissue similar to the lining of the uterus. This actually is the lining of the uterus that's sort of worked its way out into the muscle layer. And, but we do, because it is such a contributor to pain, we do see it fairly, op- fairly often within our practice. Most patients with endometriosis will have an acute exacerbation of their pain during their actual menstrual cycle. And if it's accompanied by heavy clotty bleeding, you really have to start thinking adenomyosis is a source, is, is part of the etiology of pain here. Because I think one of the myths about endometriosis is, is that it causes heavy bleeding. Endometriosis, by definition, is outside of the uterus, so it doesn't cause heavy bleeding. So when we see that heavy clotty bleeding, especially with a huge, you know, acute exacerbation of pain, we really have to be thinking adenomyosis. And they do, they do run hand in hand fairly commonly. I think the data is sort of all over the place. And we'll get into that a little bit because the diagnosis of adenomyosis truly is made after the fact, after the fact, after the time that the uterus comes out, it's made, it's a histologic diagnosis. So we don't really know the true incidence of adenomyosis with endometriosis. Some, some people I've heard will suggest that if you have deep infiltrating endometriosis, there's a 50% incidence of adenomyosis. I, I think that adenomyosis is probably much more common than we realize. And sort of like endometriosis, I think it often just kind of gets swept under the rug a little bit when patients are complaining of very heavy, very painful periods. I think there's a tendency either from the medical community or oftentimes own families. I hear it all the time. Well, you know, moms will tell their daughters, I, I had heavy painful periods. That's just what we do in our family. You have to just learn to live with it and kind of suck it up. So. Yeah, you, br- you bring up a good point about that. I hear that a lot too. And part of my history and tag, which you've probably seen in patients coming to you is tell me about obviously high school periods. And then I'm trying to capture 
family history specific in the cycle section too and asking about, oh, at Christmas, is there any conversations, you know, ha ha ha, from aunts, cousins, sisters, moms on hysterectomies, period talk, that kind of thing too, to capture that potential hook of where that could be coming from too. Yeah, I think, I think much like endometriosis, there's probably a huge genetic component to it. I think we have more finite numbers in the endometriosis world in terms of a 70% maternal inheritance rate. I think the numbers vary again with, with adenomyosis. I'm, I'm not aware of any definitive percentage if your mom had it this way, because the, the diagnosis is hard to make. It is, I, I still make it as a clinical diagnosis based on heavy, painful, clotty periods, but the pathologic diagnosis, the imaging diagnosis, we can talk about that a little bit too, is because they vary, the numbers vary so widely, it is, it is hard to sort of pin down an exact incidence of, of disease from a genetic standpoint. Yeah. Let's talk about signs and symptoms. You kind of nailed them already in there, but just to kind of recap, it's the heavy, dark clot cycle, that heavy, painful thing. Is there anything else or maybe yeah, that I mean, we don't even think? Yeah, cycle related that. Yeah, I mean, not it, it, the adenomyosis doesn't always have to present with heavy bleeding. Sometimes it can be just an acute exacerbation of pain during your cycle. And if you kind of look at the neuropelbiology world and, and some of these guys that are, that are sort of mapping out these, the, the path, the neurologic pathways of, of the pelvis, people like Mark Passover would be the, the, the best example. When you see that acute exacerbation of pain during the menstrual cycle, the, the, the uterus is involved in some way. There's really no other, other way about it. Whether there's, you know, truly adenomyosis present there on a, on a histologic or pathologic basis, it's hard to say, but the, the uterus is typically involved in some way if there's that acute exacerbation of pain. And so most patients with adenomyosis, it becomes a, I have very heavy, but not always very heavy, painful, clotty cycles. Oftentimes you'll see on, on physical exam, what we're looking for, it's often described as sort of a boggy uterus, where when you do a bimanual examination, that uterus will feel slightly enlarged. It'll feel, it'll have kind of this, it's hard to describe boggy. It's just something you sort of have to feel. But the, the, I think for me, the hallmark on a physical exam is that the, the uterus should not be tender when you're doing a physical examination and you are squeezing on that uterus, if that elicits pain, especially if that uterus feels a little bit large, feels a little bit kind of mushy, there's probably adenomyosis going on there because the uterus really should not be tender on exam. It's, it's much, you know, push your bicep. It, it doesn't really hurt. It's a muscle. If the uterus is tender like that, you have to really start thinking adenomyosis. Yeah. What are some challenges with the whole healthcare profession and diagnosing this and other conditions perhaps that overlap with this? But I think we know we've talked about this a lot with endo, how hard it is. Like, well, is there an imaging? Oh, it's spotted on an imaging thing. If you don't have it, you do have it. Is there anything to discuss with that that patients should be aware of what they're told? Well, I think that because what we alluded to earlier in that for for so many patients with these similar complaints of the very heavy, painful periods, because there's oftentimes such a familial aspect to it, a lot of patients won't think anything of it. They'll just think, oh, that's just how periods are in our family. We have, everybody has, has painful, heavy periods. The imaging is getting better. I think it, historically adenomyosis was diagnosed after the fact. It was, you removed the uterus, you did a hysterectomy goes to pathology. The pathologist says, yes, there's adenomyosis going on there. So historically that diagnosis has been made after the fact. Again, I think that we can make it clinically based on symptoms, but the imaging is also getting much better. And I, and now there are specific criteria, both in the, the vaginal ultrasound and MRI worlds of making the diagnosis of adenomyosis preoperatively so that you can sort of better plan. I will say also the, the pathology, and I don't know if this is necessarily a local thing or if this is a, a national thing. I, I think that the pathologic diagnosis oftentimes gets missed as well. 
we oftentimes will do hysterectomy or very heavy, super painful periods and the pathology comes back normal. But you have to understand that and or adenomyosis, excuse me, be, is a is a is a somewhat focal process, meaning that it's it's not often widespread throughout the entire uterus. And so, if the pathologist is just making a, a few small cuts into the uterus looking for adenomyosis, they don't see it in that particular slide. They're not going to comment on it, obviously. And so, we we often times don't get that pathologic confirmation. But we're seeing that in the endometriosis world as well. And this was a conversation recently on our minimally invasive group of surgeons that we, we sort of, we have a Facebook group and we bounce things off of each other and, and endometriosis is often getting missed as well. I've, I've had countless patients that I've done surgery on that, that had the most obvious endometriosis you've ever seen and the pathology comes back normal. And it's, it's really frustrating because then the patients are still kind of like, well, wait, did I have endo? Did I not have endo? And it's not just here. It's, it's a, it's a national problem. One of the surgeons who weighed in on this little conversation we were having said that he actually now sends pictures of the pelvis that he's operating on to the pathologist along with all of the specimens so that the the pathologist can look at the picture and say, oh yeah, there's classic blue-black endometriosis lesions here. Maybe I need to re-examine this cassette that I'm working on for the the slide. And so, yeah, we do, we do get it missed often from that perspective. But ultimately when I'm doing surgery or when I'm doing a hysterectomy for what it, what I presume is adenomyosis, and even if the pathology specimen doesn't necessarily come back, as path positive for adenomyosis, it's still really all about how the patient feels in three to six months. And I, I don't think I've ever had a patient who has finished what they need to do with their uterus, whether that's having children or not. And I leave that entirely up to them. I, I never push anything on, on anybody from a surgical perspective. I give them their options and they choose to choose your own adventure often in my clinic. But the I've never had a patient who's gotten to that point where they've, they've had two or three kids and they've had heavy, painful periods their entire life and they get a hysterectomy and then they, you know, they come back to me six months later and I've never had anyone say, I, I miss having a period. Gosh, you know, like I, I really, I really wish I was still having a period. So it, it does. We, we, I mean, we really do sort of reserve it for patients who've either decided that they don't want to have children or they're, they're done with children or it's never something that we sort of foist on them as like, this is your only option. And unfortunately I do see that in, obviously, I mean, we see that all the time in the endometriosis world in where well-intentioned, but maybe misunderstood about the, the various etiologies of pain, um, doctors will, will sort of present hysterectomy as the only option. It's your only option for pain. And I think that, I mean, this is an entirely separate conversation, but hysterectomy can be an extremely powerful tool in your, in your quiver, but it's not the only one. And you have to know when to wield it and why to wield it rather than just everybody gets a hysterectomy. And then if your pain comes back, sorry, you know, we don't have any other options, but I, I think, and we'll talk, you know, certainly we're going to talk more about, we can get into that a little bit with discussing treatments of adenomyosis and how we, how we go about treating it. So we'll, we'll shelve that for a little bit. So, yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up. I have seen tragedies lately, like on the rise. I call it tragedies. I'll just be dramatic about it, but it is 20 some year old women never even had intercourse. They're, they're still in that stage of their lives and they have a hysterectomy. They come see me and I'm like, they have every symptom still there or even worse complications from surgery going on. And I'm like, you have endo and we're sending them to an excision specialist. It's like on the rise where I'm at in my practice. It's kind of mind blowing, which leads us to what you just said. That's not the only tool for this. And especially for those who still want to preserve fertility or have babies. And we're going to do um, in the next two weeks, um, follow along or if by the time you're watching this, hit next. Um, we have a whole episode on stop. Watch this before you have a hysterectomy. We're going to kind of dive into that more and talk about that too. But let's talk about it here because last week's episode is a patient of both ours. She shares our name so I can say that. 
Naomi shares how she had a really hard time deciding if she was going to have a hysterectomy or not. And I have this in my office a lot too. They'll actually come to you or another provider. They travel a far distance. They have an excision procedure, keep the uterus, some of them will. And then they decide, you know what? No, I'm done having kids a year later. They actually want to come back to your guys' facility, have that hysterectomy. And that's a decision too. An option too that they can make is maybe not right now, go home and talk about this tomorrow. But Naomi did make that decision and she shares over and over again how life-changing that was for her in a whole wide variety of symptoms. So make sure to listen to that. But can you share um, what you see post-hysterectomy, but also what are some other treatment options if they want to preserve their fertility, but yet get some sort of symptom relief if we can prior to that happening? Yeah, I think for patients who ultimately do decide to undergo hysterectomy, it it is life changing, and I I think it has to be such a personal decision. It has to be, again, my job as a as a pelvic pain specialist is just to present options to patients, and I I generally will say, you know, this is what I think is going on. I think that there's endometriosis based on these symptoms. I think there's adenomyosis based on these symptoms. I think, you know, there might be some interstitial cystitis type stuff, and so it becomes a, a very personal decision for patients to make. And it is, it is difficult to treat patient or treat adenomyosis in patients who are desperately wanted children. And, and especially if they're actively trying to conceive, that's, that's where adenomyosis does become difficult to treat because the treatment options aren't awesome, right? There's, I mean, with endometriosis, we have a, pretty good surgical option available. If, if you can get to an excision specialist, we can excise and remove all the endometriosis. And that's a pretty good option. It's not perfect. It's, it's far from perfect. I'm, I'm not going to stand here and say it's perfect because we do have a lot of patients who have recurrent pain, not just me nationwide. That's because there's so many things contributing to pain often, but with adenomyosis, that is the hysterectomy becomes the definitive management short of that. There's not a lot of great options, especially, as I said, in a patient who is actively trying to conceive, because typically the, the mainstay of treatment for adenomyosis has been to try to hormonally shut down periods, whether that's with a continuous oral birth control, whether that's with an IUD. And I, and I do think IUDs are, are good. I think there's a role for IUDs, hormonal IUDs and, and copper IUDs. This is my own personal opinion. Copper IUD, well, it's not, the copper IUDs work by creating inflammation. That's not my personal opinion, that's fact. But my personal opinion is that a copper IUD in a patient who you suspect has adenomyosis is like the worst thing imaginable. And I think there's so many patients who are like, you know, I wanna be, I don't wanna do hormones, I wanna be all natural. And, and you sort of think, um, like if you have symptoms of adenomyosis, a copper IUD oftentimes will exacerbate those symptoms because adenomyosis also is a highly inflammatory disease. And so you've now put, a, a structure in a patient's uterus that's already inflammatory and increase that inflammation. And I, the copper IEDs are a nightmare in patients with adenomyosis. I, I, 10 out of 10 do not recommend. So what are, what are other options for treating adenomyosis besides shutting down periods, hormone, and, and really we don't have a great way of shutting down periods without using hormones. That's the, that's the reality until someone comes along and events something that can somehow shut down periods non-hormonally, short of a hysterectomy, there's not a lot of great treatment options. Some patients will use, you know, like Lysteta or, or transexamic acid to at least decrease their, their flow during their cycle. You just kind of take it for that five days uh, to decrease flow. So there is, there is a third option and that it, we, we are going to wade into a little bit of controversy here because some people are either very for them, or some people are very anti them, but that is the option of a presacral neurectomy. And what the presacral neurectomy is, is during the endometriosis excision process, or even not, I mean, you can just do them, but you actually, it's, it's actually not the presacral nerve. It actually runs in front of the lumbar space, but it's the superior hypogastric nerve plexus, and it provides innervation to the uterus and you can actually surgically resect that during an excision surgery or just do it at any time but that basically removes the the, the feeling from the uterus 
The thing with a pre-sacral neurectomy is, though, is that you're also probably destroying other sort of visceral nerve function within that superior hypogastric nerve plexus. And so a small percentage of patients can develop some urinary retention. You can develop some chronic constipation that tends to be fairly self-limiting and usually resolves. But the, but the urinary retention can be a real disaster. One, 200 patients, the data shows, will have to catheterize themselves for the rest of their lives. And then you're, you're destroying, because you're destroying some of that autonomic nerve function in that, in that plexus, there, there can be some orgasmic dysfunction. They've, they've showed, studies have showed that a small percentage of patients will, will have difficulty or be unable to achieve orgasm again after a presacral neurectomy. So it's not without its potential risks as well. But if you've got a 19 or 20 or 21 year old who's 100% certain that they want children in the future, they've tried and or failed multiple birth controls, IUDs, things like that, you're, you're really, you don't have a lot of great options because that patient, the reality is they're going to be, if they, if they truly are adamant about having children, the reality is they're going to be stuck with that uterus for 10 or 15 years. And so I, I do offer presacral neurectomy. I know that, that other surgeons do as well. Some surgeons have stopped doing them. It's hard. And, and again, you know, we present patients all the options and we present them. This is the risks. This is the benefits. You know, it's, it's, and I, and I still do them. I don't do them quite as often as I used to, but I think patients hear urinary retention and they, they don't want any part of that, but they're, it's hard. I mean, it, it's just adenomyosis is just such a challenge to treat a patients who are really adamant about fertility and actively try to conceive because obviously if I can put someone on an IUD who's actively trying to have a child. So right. you bring yeah. a good point up with all of this too. Can you share more about the mental health aspect? What endometriosis, adenomyosis, all of it, what are you seeing on that end? I see it so strongly on my end, but how are you seeing this as well? Yeah, I think the way that it sort of presents is just this sort of overall frustration. And it, it's such a hard, it's such a hard world. I mean, we talk about, we, we did, I did a podcast with Yaniv Larish and uh, the gals from Endo Battery in, in Colorado about sort of this like idea of like provider burnout because we get, we get burned out. I mean, the endometriosis world is hard. It's a hard world and patients are, I, I think when they come to this realization, especially with adenomyosis, that maybe this isn't normal. Maybe it's not normal to be bleeding through super tampons and having to change a tampon every hour for five days. I mean, when they come to that realization, you know, there is that, that sort of frustration. And I think there's also frustration when we talk about the options for adenomyosis, because again, they're not, they're not great. And it, it is, it is frustrating. It's a very frustrating, I share that frustration with my patients and that we just, we don't have a, a lot of, of options available. And it's like, well, you can either do this or you can do this. And there's not a lot of in between. And it's, it's so hard for these 20, one, 22 year olds to hear that. And so I, you know, I certainly, and I, and I don't know specific numbers or anything on depression rates or anxiety rates, but I mean, I'm sure it has to take huge toll on mental health. Yeah. Of like, I may not be able to have children because of this disease. So yeah, it's, it's, it's hard and it's, it's hard for us too. And I'm not, I'm not making this about me by any means, but it, it, it is, it is frustrating as a provider to try to treat because we don't have great options. So it's, it's, it, it becomes, there's a, I think a lot of shared frustration on both sides of it, of what to do with, with adenomyosis. So. I agree. It is, it's, it's hard. And I, I think part of it for me comes because they've seen so many providers before they get to me and I'm the first one talking about this with them and I get angry for them because they're like, what? All these years of going through this and no one's ever brought up endometriosis or adenomyosis, or they've had, heaven forbid, that hysterectomy already and they don't have children or 
you know, there's so many dynamics go into the yeah. mental health thing. There is a lot of alarming statistics out there. And part of what I do is bring in that mental health counselor provider as well. And I'm, as you know, all about team building and we have a whole team working with our patients, but mental health is definitely one of them. It's just, it's so heavy on them. And it doesn't matter their age if they're even a teenager, you know, we're kind of doing a check on that every visit and check on their mental health too, because it's pain, pain equals, you know, mental health too. So they're just, we're seeing some of, some of the worst ones in our offices too. Yeah. And I think uh, the decision whether or not to have a hysterectomy, I mean, it weighs heavily on, even on, on patients who've had children already and have completed their families. They still, there's something uniquely or inherently unique about that, that uterus. I mean, that's what sets you apart is that ability to grow life within you and to create life and bring it into the world. And it's hard to, to give that up. It's hard, even if you're done having children, it's hard sometimes to to wrap your head around the idea of of getting rid of the one thing that makes you unique. Well, there's many things, but you know what I mean. It's it it it's what for many women it defines them, and it it is a hard decision. Even in patients who have three or four kids, they they still struggle with that decision. And so you you take how hard that is for patients who have had children. And you you and you. Put that on patients who've never had children or have been unable to have children. I just did a, a hysterectomy recently on a patient who they did IVF times three. She had a fulguration surgery in 2015, but this is someone who is, is fairly prominent in town. Um, she herself is involved in the mental health world. And when we were talking through at her initial consultation, she had a really hard time with that because she was never able to have children. They did adopt and have a wonderful family and everything. So this, I mean, this patient, even in her forties was still struggling with the idea of removing that aspect of herself, even though she knew that it needed to happen. And I think ultimately she won't regret that decision, but the regret rate is very, very high for hysterectomy in especially our younger patients. And I tell, I tell patients all the time when I'm talking to them in, in either on the phone or initial patient consultation, I mean, I tell them all the time that if there is any aspect of you that is still considering starting a family, do not do this, do not do it because you will regret it. And the regret rate is, is just, it's so. It's high. I think, again, what I said earlier, when patients do finally come to that point, though, where they're totally 100% ready, they're very happy with the outcome. But for those patients who there's like maybe a 1% or 2% chance or 1% or 2% part of them that's still thinking that they want to try to do it, have, have a family or try to do that, the regret is just, it, it becomes overwhelming sometimes for patients. So, yeah, I, thank you for talking about all of that. Cause I think women need just some validation in how we are connected to that uterus, to that order and how it does set us apart and how the regret rate can be high too. So thank you for touching on that. Let's touch just a little bit about what the road to fertility might look like if you are discovering this in a patient and, you know, how fast, how slow and what age is. And there's so much that goes into that, but just what that fertility conversation maybe looks like when you're um, doing a consultation with a patient. Yeah, we have, again, this kind of goes back to the, 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 the numbers for, you know, the true incidence of adenomyosis being somewhat unknown in that we have kind of more definitive numbers in the endometriosis world. If you have endometriosis, your chances of infertility are, are this. We, we don't associate adenomyosis as much with an infertility risk as we do with a recurrent miscarriage risk. And so it's not like as much of a case of getting pregnant. It's probably more of a case of staying pregnant. And we, and we do, if you, if you think about adenomyosis as being inflammatory within the uterus, that makes it somewhat inhospitable for a, a little embryo to come down the tube and, and sit there. And so there is, there is an increased rate of, uh, of miscarriage with, with adenomyosis. Again, I'm not, I don't know the exact numbers, the, the data is somewhat all over the place. And that is a, 
an area of ongoing research as we are getting better and better at diagnosing adenomyosis with imaging. Whereas in the past, we had to really rely on it being a post-operative histologic diagnosis. As we are getting better, I think some of that data will become more clear on, you know, if you have this going on, on preoperative or on imaging, these are sort of the risks associated with that. And we'll see more of that data coming out within the next few years, I suspect. Yeah, that's a good point. The the miscarriage rates and and everything with that too. I think it, again, having a team, what's our plan going to be? How long, you know, after surgery, what happened during surgery? So many factors that probably go into that, but just like the fertility component with us too is something that's forgotten and not talked about. Let's talk whatever you want to throw in here and share. Again, this is anomyosis, but let's, we, we can't go without talking about endometriosis. I mean, I think we can never talk enough about that. What are some just things since we've talked in the last year, things that we keep seeing or you keep seeing in practice or being talked about over and over, maybe myths we need to like talk about too that have come in the last year. What's coming down the pipeline for endo too? There is another, there's another endometriosis drug that's, that's been popularized and I don't know all the specific, they're, they're doing a a hundred patient trial right now. I think out of the University of Edinburgh, but it's, it's more of, it's a non-hormonal and they're, they're sort of touting it as, you know, the first endometriosis breakthrough in the last 40 years, because all of our treatments of, of endometriosis from a, from a medication perspective have been directed at using hormones to this is more of a an anti-inflammatory and i again i don't know i don't know too much about it other than the bits and pe- bits and bobs that i've read on it but it's it's undergoing clinical trials here in the next couple of years and so that potentially is a breakthrough i i don't know how effective the 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 very limited trials that they've done have shown some 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 promising results i will say so that could be a potential source of new treatment. It's again, though, if you don't necessarily know how to recognize the signs and symptoms of endometriosis, or you're dismissing patients as having IBS or mental health disorders or any of those, are you going to necessarily recognize that you need to put a patient, even if this medication comes out and it shows, a, you know, an 80% reduction in endometriosis symptoms. It comes down to, do you have the wherewithal to recognize that that patient may or may not have endometriosis and, and therefore could benefit from that medication? I think that's the big, the big issue still. And I think I'm someone who spends way too much time diving into sort of the advocacy part of the endometriosis world. I think that's where so much of the anger still lays is that we just, we don't take it seriously. We don't, we don't recognize the signs and symptoms. We don't recognize that it's not normal for a 15 year old to miss school because of her period. We don't recognize that it's not normal for someone to have six miscarriages. We don't recognize that it's not normal for someone to not be able to get pregnant. And the more we normalize things that shouldn't be normal, it's not normal for sex to be painful ever. Under any circumstances, sex should not be painful. And so as long as we continue to normalize these things, it doesn't really matter what treatment comes out because we're not going to use it if, if we can. And I, when I say we, I mean sort of the general ob population, but, or family, whoever, you know, family practice, I think, I think there's more of a role. Um, for pediatricians to recognize a lot of this stuff. I, I, I've seen countless 15, 16 year olds who've had colonoscopies and endoscopies and told that they have IBS and it's like, well, they vomit profusely, they get bloated, nauseated, but it's like really only during their cycle. Well, wait, that's not IBS. We have to start. We just, we have to get to a point where we're putting the diagnosis of endometriosis, adenomyosis, painful bladder syndrome, pelvic floor dysfunction, we have to get to a point where these become the, the main topic of conversation. And the more that we sort of push patients to the side and ignore these symptoms, the angrier people are getting. And there's this magical thing now called the internet where 
patients talk about these things and they talk about surgeons and they talk about who to go see. And, you know, it's, it's just, it's, it would, it would be such a, a service for, for the OBs or the pediatricians or the family practice to recognize the signs and symptoms and say, okay, here, these are specialists. There are specialists, go see them, but they, but they don't. And it just becomes this endless cycle of, you know, well, let's try birth control. Oh, that one didn't work. Let's try another one. Let's try this one. And I just, I, 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 I truly do not, I, I truly don't understand it. I, I cannot wrap. It just, it's a, it's a sense of frustration. It's a sense of anger. It's a sense of helplessness. I just, I truly don't understand if you have a practice that's like 80% obstetrics and you have these complex pelvic pain patients, just send them to someone, just send them along. It, it, it's not a, an admission of weakness. It's not an admission of I, you know, I don't know how to treat that. It's just like, just send the patient and, and then we will see them or Nick Fogelson will see them or Cindy Marsparker will see, or somebody will see them and then, and then help treat them or come up with a treatment plan and then send the patient back to you. But instead what happens is these patients find us and they've already had one or two or three fulguration surgeries. They've been on 85 different kinds of birth control because if one didn't work, well, we'll just try another one. And they're just angry. And they're angry and they're like, well, why didn't, why didn't we just see you in the first place? And we could have avoided all of this. And I just, I truly, I, I just, I cannot wrap my head around it. I have no explanation for it. And I think that's a frustration that is shared pretty universally in the excision world. It, this is not unique to, to anywhere I live. This is not unique to anywhere people I've trained with. This is just a national issue where we ignore, 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 ignore the symptoms, convince the patient that it's something else. And then, okay, maybe we'll operate on you, but we're not really going to do any kind of excision surgery. We're just going to burn the lesions we can or do a hysterectomy that may or may not be necessary. Or, and then that'll be the end of it. And, and then patients eventually find us and they're, again, they're just so, they're just so angry and, and they have every right to be, they have every right to be angry. I would be infuriated if I had spent the last 10 or 15 or 20 years of my life being told that what I was feeling was not real, that, or this is normal, or maybe it's in your head, or this is just what women deal with. And then find out that there's another option out there, especially if they've undergone a surgery that didn't help in any way. And I'm certainly not saying we're perfect. I, you know, we, 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 we have patients we operate on who still have pain and, and because it is multifactorial, but, but patients generally get significantly better. And it just like, this is something that I, going back to the patient I just operated on in her forties who tried so hard to have a a, a child of her own and they had to do IVF and they did it three times and it didn't work and they adopted and she had previously been operated on back in 2014 or 15. And, you know, I, I don't, I'm not going to say that if I had operated on her, she would have absolutely 100% been able to conceive. I'm not, I'm not going to say that, but would her odds have been much better? 100%. Her odds would have been much better of either being able to naturally conceive or being successful with IVF. And it's just so frustrating that, and it, it like dawned on her when I was talking to her and she just had this complete almost breakdown in my office where she was just like, I should have done this 10 years ago. Why didn't I do this 10 years ago? Why, why did we not know this was an option 10 years ago? And so even in 10 years, nothing has really changed. Even the last 50 years, nothing has really changed. You know, it's just, it's, it, I, I have this conversation way too often and it's just it's it's like this never-ending cycle of just going around and around and around and doing the exact same thing over and over again and hoping that somewhere along the line there will be a different outcome and it's it's exhausting it's exhausting for me it's exhausting especially for my patients to just just continuously be told that that what you're experiencing is not what you're actually experiencing you I know am so 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 glad you just sent all of that like all of it 
I often joke, it's like I'm doing witchcraft in my practice or something. It's like, why is what I'm saying so um, odd or abnormal or like not true and not saying anything that's from Pinterest is my other joke too. Like I'm not making this stuff up. I always joke. I mean, like I'm so confident sometimes that I'm like, I would literally put a million dollars down on you. When you go see an excision specialist, you will have you know, and yeah. no, and or and no. And it's because I'm, you know, t- connecting with providers like you and I'm out there. You said, you mentioned that earlier, this individual that in particular that we had seen that day, they're on the internet. Patients are on the internet. They are diagnosing themselves at the time. And they come in with this knowing that's been suppressed by a different providers. So what I'm just usually doing is validating. And I, part of what I do is ask, you know, hey, if you saw something on the internet, I want to hear that. Let's talk about it. And I'm allowing that safe space to talk about what they've seen on the internet. And then I'm just simply helping point them in a different direction. And I said, it's that like, no trust factor. I come to their level. I'm never going to say, don't be on the internet looking at stuff. Or are you Dr. Google now? And like suppressing that tool they have. It's a tool they have for their health. And we have to acknowledge that. So thank you so much for sharing that, that part too. Is there anything else about adenomyosis that you would like to share today? Yeah, adenomyosis, if you know the questions to ask, but this again comes down to a, a training thing. I mean, when I, when I came out of my general OBGYN residency and I saw a patient with pelvic pain on my schedule, I, I really wasn't taught what are the questions to ask. And I think I only really kind of got that in fellowship. And, and more so just, just in my own practice of, of treating thousands and thousands and thousands of pelvic pain patients is you learn, you learn those questions to ask, you learn that nuanced difference between, um, endometriosis, between adenomyosis, between pelvic floor dysfunction. And I don't think it needs to be this big mystery. And I, and I do think that there is, I think there's probably more hope on the horizon for adenomyosis as imaging gets better. I think that transvaginal ultrasound MRI is becoming so much more sensitive. You still have to have someone who, who knows what they're looking at, but as our imaging becomes more and more sensitive for adenomyosis, I think that we will demystify some of that a little bit. It doesn't necessarily change though, how we treat it. And that's still where we struggle with the adenomyosis for all the reasons we talked about earlier is that there's not there's just not a lot of great treatment options, especially in someone who is actively trying to conceive. And so I think, but, but at least, at least the, the, the change in imaging or the improvement in imaging, at least that will change the conversation. So patients are at least aware. And I think knowledge is power for patients because 40 years ago, 30, I mean, even five or 10 years ago, there was sort of this mystery as like, what's happening to me? What am I what am I experiencing? Why is it being normalized when I don't think it's normal? And, and when patients come to me, I'm like, no, that's not normal. None of what, none of what you're telling me is normal. And I'm sorry, that's been normalized for you. None of that is normal. It is not normal to miss school. It is not normal for sex to hurt. It is not normal to miss out on social functions because you're on your, on your period. None of that is normal. And so as we, as we get better at diagnosing it, perhaps we can change the narrative about or demystify at least the diagnosis. So patients know what's going on and they know that what they're experiencing is not normal. And then, and then from there, hopefully, you know, the domino effect and maybe we'll get some better, better treatment options for it. But I think, I think first and foremost is we have to educate patients on what is normal and what is not normal. And, and that is, and that's where the, you know, I, I know a lot of doctors get really intimidated by patients like Googling stuff, but that's, I mean, if, if patients are being told repeatedly that everything is fine, everything's normal, or, you know, we did an ultrasound, it doesn't show anything. So you're fine getting on endo girls blog and, and getting on these, I mean, that's where they're going to get that, that information. And that is, that is so powerful for patients to experience that that realization that, oh, this is not, this is not normal. This is not how it's supposed to be. And there are options out there. There are things that I can do, or there are people that I can see who can maybe fix this for me. 
So. Absolutely. Well, thank you again. Follow along all month or hit next, depending on the time when you're watching this. We have some amazing content coming here towards teenage girls. And of course, we're going to continue our conversation on hysterectomy. And I'm going to yeah. link, of course, Dr. Duke's contact information on Instagram. I'm going to put our very first episode that we did to a year ago in the comments all about endometriosis. It's such a jam-packed episode that I think it, maybe this is the first time you're finding us. We'll have you go back and watch that too. There's so much like content in there too. So thank you so much for all the work you do yeah. for advocating and everything. Yeah, you're welcome. I'm I'm off to the end of summit the next weekend that that Sally and Andrea do, and that's going to be really cool. It's just a, a great place for its endometriosis advocates, physical therapists, surgeons to kind of all to get together and what are you know what are we talking about now what are we doing now where are we going with all of this how do we shape policy how do we change sally's whole thing is how do we change the narrative around endometriosis around adenomyosis so that'll be really great i'm looking forward to kind of hopefully diving in more topics after i get back from that so i'm gonna link that as well because i think patients need to know that that's for them too that is not yeah yeah patients there's, to go there's, a to. Patients, there's a lot of patients who go to that it's really kind of cool i've actually connected uh in the last few years with a few people that i've operated on which is really neat so yeah yeah, yeah i'll link that in in all the show notes you guys can go check it out it is an amazing resource and and one that is again such a cool event to bring providers and patients together so Again, thank you for being the voice for all of us in that too.